Hello everyone. Good evening and uh, good morning wherever you are. And that back we are for the third episode of our chat show, so to speak. And uh, welcome, Dr. Thala, and thank you for sparing the time. I'm really enjoying uh, speaking to you on different topics. And today, especially, we have quite a few uh, interesting cases to discuss. Most of them are related to congenital anomalies in the GI tract. And uh, we will not go into the theoretical details as we have done uh, before. We'll be sticking to the practical aspects, mainly a few All tips. about practical. Exactly. Yeah. A few tips for the people who are looking after something we have seen. Uh, we may share some cases. We came across some difficult episodes related to such cases as well. So without wasting much, much time, I mean, I would like to request all of you to stay till the end because towards the end, we have a surprise. We have a very practical and very interesting segment, which Dr. Tala will be presenting in the end. So don't miss it. Uh, it will be related to the cases that we discuss as well. Uh, the first case, uh, I mean, it's interesting. When I was training in India, we had a baby who was like uh, around two kilos, scrawny looking. And uh, the nurse told me that the baby has continuous frothing of saliva. Uh, as soon as I went there, something struck me and I requested for a feeding tube to pass through the nose and lo and behold, it didn't pass through uh, more than five, six centimeters. So it was clear that uh, this case, uh, this child had possibly sufficient atresia. So we then, uh, we didn't have a replogal tube in India at that stage and we just went for a feeding tube, uh, x-ray and then confirmed we had a pediatric surgeon who could come and assess it happened to be a tracheophysial fistula. So this is one of the most uh, important diagnosis to make because of the implications. If you don't make a timely diagnosis, they may end up aspirating. And uh, obviously the prognosis worsens if you don't treat. And it's typical picture that you have a male baby growth restricted and you have uh, this kind of a finding. So uh, can you share some points about tracheophysial fistula or esophageal atresia? and what you'd like to share based on your experience and then I'll chip in as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's funny, I think that even though we always assume that these babies are going to be caught prenatally, um, they aren't necessarily. So we'll talk about this like for the rest of today, that, you know, the biggest clue that you've got something going on in the gastrointestinal system is if there's a lot of polyhydramnios prenatally. So as you all know, during pregnancy, the babies are constantly swallowing amniotic fluid and then absorbing it and then peeing it out. If there's lots and lots of amniotic fluid, then you can kind of guess that maybe the baby isn't swallowing it properly. And a big reason for that, a common reason for that is because we may have an obstruction somewhere in the GI tract. Generally, the higher the obstruction is, so the closer it is to the mouth, then the more likely you're going to end up with polyhydramnia. So if a baby has like an anal atresia, you're not necessarily gonna end up with polyhydramnios. If the baby has an esophageal atresia, which obviously like they can't swallow anything with that, then it would be less, uh, it would be more likely for them to have polyhydramnios. But what you also said in this case was that the baby also had a tracheoesophageal fistula. So this wasn't an isolated esophageal atresia. So what was happening here, and normally when these tracheoesophageal fistulas happen, normally they're distal. And we'll talk about that at the end. But the esophageal atresia will end up with having a uh, the uh, blockage at the level of the esophagus. And then the trachea basically will have will have an opening and then there is a little shortcut between the trachea and the bottom part of the esophagus that then goes towards the stomach so because of that fluid can go down the trachea across the fistula and then into the stomach that way and so what can happen is that the fluid isn't nearly as much as you would expect it to be so if you don't have polyhydramnios, then basically this baby is more likely to have also a fistula in, in place. So uh, that might be why this mommy prenatally didn't have polyhydramnios and why it wasn't diagnosed prenatally. And they can be missed very easily prenatally. To be honest, I mean, uh, it's not a surprise that such cases get missed in India because most of them are referred from smaller centers. 
Yeah, and, uh, and maybe didn't have ultrasounds at all. But generally, even kind of the old fashioned measuring where you measure, you know, the abdominal circumference for pregnant for pregnant ladies, if they're measuring much larger to size, then somebody starts thinking, OK, something else could be going on here. So basically, you can have different variations where you can have an esophageal atresia, the fistula might be distally or it might be proximal. The most common case is exactly the one that you mentioned, which is that you have an esophageal fistula and esophageal atresia and then a distal tracheoesophageal fistula. And the way that we would be able to differentiate this on an X-ray is that if you got an X-ray with a pure esophageal atresia, then you wouldn't see any gas distally. So there wouldn't be any gas in the stomach. There wouldn't be any gas distally. If the baby, but like Dr. Sridhar said, you would see the esophageal uh, probe, whatever it is, whether it's a gavage tube, it would be stuck somewhere in the, in the throat. If it is an esophageal atresia with a tracheoesophageal fistula, then you would see gas because the gas had gone down, like we said, down the trachea, across the fistula and into the stomach. So you would actually see gas in the stomach in addition to seeing the uh, gavage tube kind of like stuck high up, much lower than, much higher up than where you'd expect it to be. So I don't know if you want me to talk about treatment or anything. Uh, or we'll, we uh, I mean, we'll just discuss a few points related to the immediate management. So, for example, we suggest keeping the head and elevated so that the pooling of secretions, I mean, the risk to this baby is from aspiration. And the aspiration happens when the baby uh, gets the saliva overflowing. It's baby's own secretions that the baby gets collected in the pouch, which is the proximal end of the esophagus, which you said is atretic. And then it goes through the trachea into the lungs, obviously, because the baby cannot do anything with the secretions. So keeping the head and elevated and uh, regular suctioning uh, to empty the pouch is important. And uh, in this situation, uh, obviously, early surgery is better if the surgeon identifies the problem, uh, I mean, can be fixed immediately. Uh, it's very important that an esophageal atresia with the fistula, we don't give too much gas to distend the stomach because sometimes these babies have associated anal atresia. And remember, you can't put a feeding tube into the stomach to decompress it. So till the gas goes through the rectum, you cannot really empty or decompress. So the more gas you put into the intestine and the abdomen sometimes gets distended, especially if the baby has an ammonia and you need pressure. So it's better to uh, bypass the fistula if possible when you're intubating, especially if the baby has aspirated and has a lung disease. So this is one tip. The other important point is deciding when to choose uh, intermittent suction versus reflogal tube. So Riplogal tube is obviously a special type of tube which we use for uh, some suctioning, which is basically connecting to the continuous suction and the tube keeps sucking out. And we pull it out like 0.5 centimeter below where it hits the end of the pouch. So we don't hit it uh, touching the mucosa, we just pull it back 0.5 centimeter. So we have to be careful with where we fix it. And uh, this is usually in babies who are more stable and where you cannot uh, operate quickly uh, because there are the types of uh, esophageal atresia where the gap is too wide to be fixed quickly and the type 1 atresias which are uh, going not associated with the fistula as well. So they don't need an immediate repair. The baby needs to grow. You may uh, do a gastrostomy to feed them and then wait for the baby to grow to repair later. So these kind of babies is where typically you need a replogal tube and uh, it's less intensive on the nurses. But the babies, of course, need to be in the intensive care because anytime uh, they have a choking-like episode or desaturation, you may need to do intermittent suction. The more acutely unwell babies, you would be sucking them out intermittently or some of these babies are very thick secretion. So these babies also need intermittent suction. The key is to prevent aspiration pneumonia because that complicates the uh, actual process. Uh, do you have any issues getting replogal tubes or uh, I mean, uh, uh, fixing them? Any, any concerns in your team? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, just kind of even before we go through the fixing, just remember, and you kind of alluded to this, that these can be uh, part of the Vacteral syndrome. So uh, anytime you have a baby with an esophageal atresia, you do have to do all the other tests to make sure that they don't have vertebral issues, that they don't have uh, anal atresia, cardiac um, TE fistula renal issues. So on all these babies, you should be getting an echo. You should be getting a renal ultrasound, obviously doing a very good physical exam. Make sure that they don't have anal atresia. So even before you're going to surgery, if there is a fistula, it means that basically you've got this one-way pathway of air going into the stomach with no escape. 
So there's no, you know, the esophagus isn't connected. So once that air gets in, it has to go all the way down the intestine before the air gets out. So these babies, you can end up with a perforation of the stomach or of the intestine because the air gets in and there's nowhere to go. So with an esophageal atresia and a TE fistula, these are kind of like more emergent kind of operations. If there isn't a fistula, then yes, it obviously needs to be repaired. You're worried about aspiration, but you have, you know, a little bit more time to get these repaired. And then like you were saying, um, the repair can either be done primar primarily. So if you can take the top part of the esophagus and the bottom part of the esophagus, hopefully if you can kind of squeeze them together, then the surgeon can kind of fix it primarily. And a lot of the time though, the bottom part of the esophagus is way too far away from the stomach. And even however much they kind of try to pull it, it can't be done in a primary repair. So in those cases, they have to you know, very often tie off the fistula, ligate the fistula, put a gastrostomy tube in, and then basically just keep the baby with like a gastric, with a with an esophageal suction, whichever type that you use, until the baby's bigger. Very often we kind of do bougies where we like press down, like on the top part of the esophagus, trying to kind of lengthen it out as much as possible before we can try to put those two pieces together. It's really hard to get the home health gastric suction and on to, to set that up. And honestly, I think as a mother, that's something that would really scare me anyway, um, just taking a baby home because they can choke so easily. So sometimes when we can't do the primary anastomosis, these babies are in hospital for a really long time before we can kind of get those together. Yeah, Once it really is cool. finally done, yeah, once it is finally done, the babies generally do really well, though. <laughs> And the surgeons are becoming more expert at doing Z techniques and stretching it. So, yeah. I mean, they assess at the time of the initial uh, surgery what they can do, either just a gastrostomy. I mean, these are not the common types. As you mentioned, the one with the tracheoesophageal fistula is a common type, and there usually primary repair is possible. But there are some babies where, uh, again, uh, it, they have to assess and decide. One point about the primary repair is that uh, there is something called the trans anastomotic tube, which is inserted by the surgeon during the procedure itself through the bypassing the connected uh, esophageal ends. So this is kind of holding the two ends of the esophagus, which have been stitched together. And it is like a feeding tube, but one of the key things the surgeon will tell you to guard with your life, because if the tube slips out, your anastomosis may break. And obviously, to reinsert uh, through those uh, stitched part is going to be very difficult. So obviously, this is another important tip if you are managing a post-operative baby where primary repair of the esophageal, uh, esophageal atresia has been done. Uh, you should be very careful with the transanastomotic tube, especially if the baby is intubated and you have to reintubate such a baby, you still have to keep the feeding tube. Many of us don't like to have the feeding tube when we are intubating such babies. So you shouldn't remove this tube. So if you are a junior resident on the team and be very aware that if the baby has a tracheosophageal fistula repair or is a fistula atresia repair, be clear that the transanastomotic tube has to be remaining there. Once the baby is healed by 10 to 14 days, the surgeon usually does a diet test to see if the anastomosis is healthy. And uh, they would have started feeding the baby through the tube anyway. So uh, you would start removing it gradually as well. So uh, any more points to add about tracheosophageal fistula? You mentioned Vactrel. We mentioned the screening. Obviously, the family can find it very stressful. It's very important to illustrate to them what is happening. The surgeons are very good with diagrams as well. And uh, they would usually show them the exact picture. There is a little bit of uncertainty in the beginning as to what exactly would happen. And so we have to tell them the or possible options that they would take depending on what they find. So <clears throat> hopefully this is not syndromic. In many cases, vectoral associations are just associations. So many times it's not inherited. So they don't need to worry about the further uh, kids in the family. Of course, I mean, we can never say with the poly uh, multifactorial inheritance and so on. So do you want to add anything more about recursive visual fistula? Or will... No, just that, um, which we honestly might as well lean into this at this point, since we've sp spoken about it for a long time. Um, just that, you know, obviously, like you said, that we are worried about that that when the where the throat was reanastomosed, that it's not leaky at all. So exactly like you said, before we properly start feeding orally, we have to do a dye study. So we put some dye, you know, from the mouth down the esophagus and make sure it's not leakage. 
because they don't have the kind of same uh, strength and the same, uh, you know, sphincter at the bottom, the esophagus, then they are more concerned that the acid from the stomach can kind of go back up and irritate that area of um, anastomosis as well as the bottom of the throat. So this is one of the few cases in neonatology now where we might end up putting the babies on uh, proton pump inhibitors just because they don't want the acid going up and irritating the throat. We really avoid these in medicine now. We don't give Zantac, we don't give proton pump inhibitors unless it's a very specific case like this where we really don't want it damaging anything surgically. So often these babies are sent home on like a PPI. A very nice point. Thank you. And of course, these babies are at risk of reflux later on as well. So we have to be careful yeah. with their feeding and positioning. So moving on to the second case, I mean, this is a very important scenario for everyone concerned, right, from parents, nurses to our medical uh, trainees and doctors. So we have a two or three day old baby in the ward who is otherwise well term baby, healthy, no risk factors for infection. And the mother calls a nurse to say that the baby has greenish vomits a couple of times. Uh, the nurse initially thinks it's light yellow and then the second time it's actually deep green. So she decides to call the doctor to check. So uh, this is a very common scenario. And uh, can you describe why we are worried about a green vomit and what we should be doing in such cases? Yeah, so green vomit or what we call bilious emesis is always concerning. And this is kind of part of my discharge uh, sign out to families because adults, if you vomit enough, eventually it's going to be green because you don't have anything in the stomach. So it's people aren't used to how scary it is. But bilious emesis is concerning because it can mean that something very bad is going on. So the thing that we're really worried about in uh, in newborns, especially in, in full-term babies, is that we're worried that there is an obstruction um, in the gut or even more concerningly, because this is an emergency. So you could have an obstruction in the gut and you know it's okay if you take a couple of days to fix it, but the type of obstruction could be a volvulus. And that is what we have to figure out immediately. Are we missing a volvulus here? So a volvulus basically is where the gut isn't necessarily stuck in the areas where it should be. So that's what we call a malrotation. So there is, specific areas of the intestine that are normally in positions. For example, the duodenum is on the other side of the vertebra from the stomach. And then the cecum is, as you all know, right where, you know, like the appendix is or whatever. So in some babies, for whatever reason, the intestines are positioned slightly abnormally. And because of that, they're at much easier risk of coming loose and just kind of like twisting on themselves. So when they twist on themselves, the vascular supply can be cut off. And so the baby does have an obstruction. The baby will start puking and maybe puking green. But more importantly, what we're worried about is if that is a vascular compromise, that baby needs surgery immediately. And the only way to save the gut is to immediately untangle that volvulus. So this is why all bilious emesis in a baby is an absolute emergency. You have to rule out, does this baby have a volvulus? I felt like you were about to say something. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, you covered the points about why it's important to pick it up immediately. And it's interesting that uh, about one in five of these babies may end up needing a surgical procedure and the surgeons are always very keen yeah. in getting them quickly because even if they look well uh, it takes time for the volvulus to uh, have the ischemic changes and the baby to become sick so that becomes too late at that stage and the main idea in these cases is to save as much gut as we can and without ischemia and without removing the gut if possible because short gut syndrome is a very difficult problem to manage so the surgeons are really keen that we shouldn't wait for the baby to be sick and a baby being sick or acidotic or, uh, I mean, having significant distension is a late sign in these babies. So don't wait. I looked through the guidelines uh, from the American Academy and uh, other sources. And obviously, it's better not to discharge these babies without a clear assessment. Uh, GI contrast study is better to rule out a malrotation. Uh, obviously, we don't want to go too much into the embryologic basis of why a malrotation happens, but it's just that the gut has a twisting uh, 
um, I mean, during the developmental stage before it goes back, it develops outside the yolk sac and then it goes back in and during this process, it's incomplete. So well, one of the ways we can diagnose is also by doing the ultrasound, uh, but you need good expertise and it doesn't always correlate even if you have. So we are looking at the superior mesenteric vessels, the vein and the artery. And the easy way to remember it is that we often read about the van structures, vein, artery, nerve, when we read about anatomical relations. So similarly, here it starts with the vein uh, and then the artery comes, superior mesenteric artery comes to the uh, left of the spine. So the vein comes uh, to the right and uh, the relationship is that way. But if the re relationship is reversed, the vein is to the left of the superior mesenteric artery. Uh, then you are going to be more likely to have, uh, I mean, uh, malrotation. But it doesn't always mean that. Also, some people comment on the bubble gas distribution. But uh, in my experience, I have not found it very conclusive. Though they say if most of the small intestine seems to be on one side, you can think of malrotation. So the key thing is you cannot really find out by simple X-ray or uh, even ultrasound if they're experts doing it. You may have a higher index of suspicion, but it doesn't pick up all the cases. So best if, if you have definite green vomit, I mean, light yellow vomit can happen. Colostrum can sometimes be yellowish as well and uh, partly digested uh, milk can become yellowish. But if it is green, uh, the bile uh, dark green color that uh, I think you'll be showing later. So that is the typical color that we should be really cautious. And the key focus should be not to delay. Even though we say one in five babies will need surgery, one in five is a very big number. So, and these are babies where if you don't intervene adequately early, you may end up losing a significant chunk of their gut and short gut is a nightmare to manage as you'd watch. So, uh, do you want to add anything about this? Yeah. So, obviously, you know, like we say in medicine, we're always like, what is the most common cause and what is the scariest cause? The scariest cause of a, in, of, of green vomit in a term baby is a malro, as, as of actual, not just malro, but it's actually volvulized. So we need to take care of that immediately. In a preemie baby, the most scary cause of green vomit, if they don't have a volvulus, obviously preemie babies can have the same thing as term, but more commonly it would be neck. So then there's a whole bunch of other things that can cause a baby to puke green as well. So you could have an obstruction anywhere. The obstruction has to be below where the bile comes into the intestine. So remember the bile is produced by the liver and then stored in the gallbladder and then dumped out into the duodenum. So if you have an obstruction proximal to that, above that, so say you have a pyloric stenosis, if you have a pyloric stenosis, which is at the end of the stomach, the little sphincter is like blocked or narrowed, then obviously you're not going to be puking bile. You're going to be puking juices from the stomach, right? The obstruction has to be after the duodenum, basically, to actually have bilious vomiting. But really, any obstruction, whether it's actually anatomical, like a volvulus, where the intestine is just coming to a stop, or any atresia. So you could have a duodenal atresia, you could have like in the double bubble signs, you could have an ileal atresia. If you have a colonic atresia, it might take a few days, but you might end up with a bilious emesis. Or it could be more of a functional, like it's not an absolute anatomical blockage, but rather the intestine isn't squeezing down. So if the baby is septic, then the intestine isn't going to be undergoing peristalsis. So a baby's puking green, you should probably make sure that this baby isn't septic. Maybe the mother got a bunch of um, uh, narcotics during delivery. Maybe the mother got magnesium during delivery and they're still inside the baby and kind of slowing the gut down. So there's lots of reasons that could actually slow the gut down as well. So a lot of them can be actually checked by checking a CBC to make sure that whether we're septic or not sure, maybe a mag level as well, get an x-ray, see if there are signs kind of consistent with an obstruction. If you see air throughout and then there's air in the rectum as well, then it's less likely that this is some sort of anatomic obstruction and more likely some sort of ileus. Um, and then again, we should get a contrast study because we should be making sure that this baby doesn't have a volvulus or even if they do have some sort of atresia, it would be nice to know at what level we think that atresia is at. That's good. And uh, obviously this is the approach most of us follow. And if you don't have facilities for a surgeon or uh, the radiology uh, assessment with the contrast, uh, better to transfer the baby to such a center. I mean, uh, 
and don't delay uh, thinking that the baby looks well or the x-ray looks well because these are huge medical legal liabilities as well. And one important point I would like to make with uh, in terms of obstruction, I've seen some cases where the stomach has a lot of uh, meconium at the time of delivery because of an atresia, for example. And uh, one practice in some of the developing parts of the world is to suction the stomach contents. So never do suction for the stomach contents. You can put a feeding tube and uh, or a large bore feeding tube and aspirate as many times as you need. But just because the stomach looks very distended, don't put a suction catheter in because a suction catheter delivers a very high level of pressure and there is going to be mucosal injury and you may risk gastric perforation and things like that. So uh, I don't think you will face that in the US, but in many developing parts of the world, they often put a suction catheter, connect to the wall section to empty the stomach contents, which should never be done. Even if the stomach is huge, always use a syringe to empty the stomach as well. So uh, this is one tip related for the developing part of the world. Uh, so we have reasonably dealt with, of course, these babies, any baby with the gut obstruction has a gut distension and there is a risk of wall ischemia. And that's one of the reasons why we focus on giving antibiotics in these cases as well. So uh, nilper oral antibiotics, keeping the stomach decompressed. You may put a large bore feeding tube and regular uh, free drainage. And um, I mean, I don't know if you monitor the intestinal, I mean, the abdominal girth, which may or may not be helpful. So these are things which uh, practices might differ as well. So uh, I think uh, we will just discuss one more case, uh, more distal obstruction. Uh, so there is a four-day-old baby who didn't pass stool for first two days, then had a smear of meconium, but then has been developing abdominal distension. So this is a fairly common scenario, and the distension is quite significant in this case. Uh, the X-ray shows gaseous distension of the bowel. So we admitted the baby, kept the baby NPO, IV fluids were started, antibiotics were started because there is significant bowel dilatation. So what would be the commonest differential in this scenario? We'll keep it brief and then we will go to the slideshow that we discussed. So, I mean, I think that uh, it's the differential is very similar. I mean, that we have uh, some sort of narrowing somewhere um, or some sort of ileus, like everything else. I mean, just because the baby's a few days older, um, you know, hasn't passed stool. That was kind of more of the presenting sign before the abdominal distension, before the puking. So you think, OK, this is probably more distal. So in addition to like a colonic atresia, obviously somebody Obviously, it's not anal atresia because there was a bit of a, a smear. But the two things that I would kind of also have on my list were, is this like a um, small left colon? So a lot of uh, diabetic uh, infants of, um, of diabetic mothers, the uh, whole left colon, so kind of the descending colon can be a much thinner caliber than it's supposed to be. And that can kind of present in this way. And really, it's just a lot of time waiting for it. Babies can also have meconium plugs where they just have like a bunch of meconium just like stuck in there or meconium ileus which happens kind of in cf or cystic fibrosis where the meconium is like really sticky and it's not moving forward um or you'd also be thinking of Hirschsprungs. And Hirschsprungs is where the nervous system of the gut isn't fully formed. So the middle layer of the gut has its own autonomic nervous system. Like I'm not thinking, oh, I'm going to, you know, cause peristalsis now. That's happening without me thinking about it. So the middle layer of the gut has a nervous system and it kind of, that nervous system populates the gut from the mouth and then all the way down to the colon. So after the gut is formed, the nervous system is still coming in and innovating it. Sometimes the nervous system doesn't reach the very end of the rectum and it kind of stops halfway down the colon or a little bit further down the colon. So that last little bit of rectum doesn't have any nerves to squeeze it out. So what ends up happening is that it's unable to squeeze. So just above that uninnovated area. So where there are nerves, all that, all the stool and the secretions and everything build up right there. And that's what you call the transitional zone, that space between where you don't have nerves to where you do have nerves. And that would be Hirschsprungs. This is a very typical way for Hirschsprungs to present. So I'm going to say this for anybody that's still listening now. If you are referring a baby because of abdominal distension or bilious emesis, you should be doing as part of your physical exam you should be doing a rectal exam to make sure that this or to decrease the likelihood or to kind of give you more idea of whether this is Hirschsprungs or not. Normally, the distal part, the Hirschsprungs is very, very distal. 
So the way that I do rectal exams is I take a Q-tip. So, you know, one of those things that people used to put in their ears and then put it with a lubricant like KY jelly and insert it very gently into the anus and into the rectum, just up a couple of centimeters. Normally, if it is Hirschsprung's, especially if it's distal and that's the majority, you pull it out, the stool will come like barreling out because you've pushed it past the area without the nerves. So I cannot tell you how many times we've had babies that have been transferred from other places that we've done this and you feel like the diagnosis is right there. If you're putting that in and the stool comes out, I mean, I've had to change scrubs, you know, like completely like covered in poop, then you've pretty much got a diagnosis of Hirschsprung. So that really should be part of your physical exam. Yes, I mean, uh, and uh, ileal atresia and things like that can have meconium as well because atresias might happen due to the vascular loss later on. So passing meconium doesn't rule it out. So it doesn't rule um, out the complete obstruction. Absolutely. I think we will not go into the details of treatment of hertzsprung like syndromes, but uh, you beautifully uh, discussed the overview of it. And of course, there can be a short segment or long segment hertzsprung and the presentation can be different accordingly. Bubble atresias are a big topic altogether. <laughs> So uh, I think, uh, can you share this uh, screen and uh, present? Uh, you should be able to share now. Okay, let me move that. I mean, this is, okay, play from start. Okay, we're just gonna run through these quickly. So this is bilious emesis. So you can see this greeny stuff that was like, the baby had obviously uh, vomited it up and this was on all the secretions. So get used to seeing this kind of greeny, yellowy fluorescent color. You know, a lot of the times, you know, it, people call it bilious, but it's not, it's just the formula or whatever. But you see this weird fluorescent color, that is always scary, always scary. Good. We have okay. three minutes in total. So. Okay, I can do this. I can do this. This is bloody stool. We didn't really go over this, but bilious emesis and bloody stool is neck until proven otherwise. So just also, I can't tell you how obsessed I am with looking at stool. I'm constantly going through trash cans, looking through diapers and looking at what the stool looks like. So this is very bloody. Get used to that. And then this is a baby with really bad abdominal distension. Um, so you can just see how hard the belly is. Um, you know, just it's big, it's full. You can see all the veins really fully. It looks super uncomfortable. This was actually a case of a, of a volvulus. Um, but, you know, a distension can look like that if you do have like an ileal atresia or you do have um, neck or lo lots of other things. But just kind of get used to the abdominal exam is probably the most important exam that we doing on, on a day-to-day -day basis because it can change so quickly. And then these are the different types of the tracheoesophageal fistulas. So like we said, this is the esophageal atresia with a distal fistula. So look, exactly like Dr. Sid, uh, Sidras uh, uh, said, the esophagus just cuts off randomly there, but we did have air in the stomach because it was going down the trachea, down the distal part of the esophagus and into the stomach. That's easily the most common. So that's going to be the baby with the OG probe that gets stuck at the top, and then you've got air in the stomach. I have to go faster. This is neck. Uh, we're not going to talk about more than that. You know, it's just a very bad inflammation of the intestines. And then this is the pneumatosis intestinalis in the neck. You can see the railroad tracks and all the bubbly appearance. Then the classic uh, sign that you see in duodenal atresia, so the double bubble sign. So this first bubble is the stomach. This second bubble is the distal part of the, uh, of the duodenum or the proximal part of the duodenum. And then you don't have gas anywhere else. So this looks like it was a complete obstruction rather than a volvulus, because maybe you just have, you know, that's where the, the intestine was actually um, rotating on itself. But in this part, it's a bit more reassuring. And then this is the Hirschsprungs that we described. So this is Hirschsprungs where you have down here, you don't have any ganglion cells. So down here, you don't have the nervous system um, of, the, of the middle part of the intestine. And here is where all the food gets stuck because it can kind of squeeze down to here. So if you put a Q-tip up past this, then all that poop will come flying out. I did it, Dr. Strida. Perfect. I mean, you can stop sharing, so we'll have time to say bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, no. How do I stop sharing? There we go. That's okay. Perfect. So uh, I think this was amazing today, and I'm sure everyone would enjoy the last three minutes. Uh, <laughs> show as well. 
I think uh, we look forward to more practical clinical oriented sessions as well. So thank you for the great effort and uh, we thank everyone for their comments and supportive statements as well. So with this, we'll close the meeting. Bye-bye. Great. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone.